but because there are race differences in IQ, the general view is IQ is a bad test. It doesn't measure and it doesn't matter. We can't allow that IQ matters. Uh, because IQ is heritable, we can't allow that heritability matters. Uh, environment has to be everything. Uh, the left has always believed that environment can overcome everything else. The left is full of sex difference deniers. Now, it's not that the left denies evolution. That's fine for other animals. But evolutionary psychology? Well, that's almost sexist and racist. No, evolution didn't shape human beings. There are few branches of modern science more divisive, more prone to stir up tribal passions at the mention of its name than evolutionary psychology. Far from being an innocent and inevitable extension of evolutionary theory to the human mind, opponents will say that evolutionary psychology is the academic fatherland of shoddy research in service to lazy stereotypes. They see a field so prone to fanciful storytelling, and so lacking in rigour, that its name has become a punchline. Its portrayal in progressive media has rarely been flattering, and it's not unusual to hear it dismissed as a pseudoscience used to lend faux scientific legitimacy to sexism, racism, and a deeply conservative view of human nature. But to many proponents, evolutionary psychology is nothing more than the application of well-tested Darwinian theory to the human brain, which should be treated no differently than any other organ. To reject it is to arbitrarily declare the human mind immune to the forces of nature. Evolution, as I like to say, didn't stop at the neck. From this perspective, sceptics of evolutionary psychology are often seen as ideologically motivated. Lacking valid scientific criticisms, they reject the field because of its perceived political implications, or because it contradicts a deeply held dogma, that the human mind is a blank slate, moulded by its environment alone. If the blank slate isn't true, they say, then inequality of outcome isn't necessarily the result of unfair and unequal treatment. Women may be underrepresented among CEOs and physicists, not because of discrimination or differences in socialization, but because of innate differences in preferences and abilities. Worse than offending the sensibilities of doctrinaire liberals, it is argued that the denial of human nature distorts the study of human beings, especially the social sciences, and leads to fantastical beliefs, such as claiming that many gender differences are the result of socialization, rather than the expression of an unchanging human nature. In a recent paper, leading evolutionary psychologist David Buss wrote that the view that our mind is a blank slate at birth, and is corrupted solely by the ills of bad environment, has been adopted by social psychologists, as it is most conducive to their left-wing ideology. This view was given its most thorough expression by Steven Pinker in his 2002 book, The Blank Slate, in which he explains the mindset thus. When it comes to explaining human thought and behaviour, the possibility that heredity plays any role at all still has the power to shock. To acknowledge human nature, many think, is to endorse racism, sexism, war, greed, genocide, nihilism, reactionary politics, and neglect of children and the disadvantaged. But it seems critics of evolutionary psychology aren't the only ones to associate it with far-reaching social implications. When James Damore published his infamous memo arguing that biologically rooted differences in abilities and preferences were responsible for the underrepresentation of women at Google, he claimed that evolutionary psychology backed him up. And Jeffrey Miller, evolutionary psychologist and world-leading expert in lap dancing research, was quick to agree while making a familiar accusation of Damore's critics. If American businesses want to remain competitive in a global market, they must open their eyes to the research and ground their policies in the known facts about the genetic evolution of sex differences, rather than blank slate delusions about the social construction of gender. The evolutionary psychology research on sex differences is one of the best reasons to expect that there may still be some inequalities of outcome in particular jobs, companies, and industries. Writing on the same theme, biologist Colin Wright had this to say of skeptics. Evolutionary explanations for human behaviour challenge their a priori commitment to blank slate psychology, the belief that male and female brains in humans start out identical and that all behaviour, sex-linked or otherwise, is entirely the result of differences in socialisation. 
and it was the same publication neuroscientist Larry Cahill accused neuroscientist Gina Rippon of engaging in what is effectively a denial of evolution, implying to her reader that we should ignore the profound implications of animal research when trying to understand sex influences on the human brain. She is right only if you believe evolution in humans stopped at the neck. And this accusation of evolution denialism isn't confined to the pages of Quillette, as Jonathan Haidt demonstrated in the clip at the beginning. Haidt is a prominent psychologist turned culture warrior who has spent the last few years warning anyone who will listen about the danger of the liberal monoculture and political intolerance developing on college campuses, a talk he's invited to give at many college campuses. According to Haidt, the underrepresentation of conservatives within the social sciences has left them with a crippling left-wing bias, resulting in a refusal to accept the fact, as he sees it, of innate race and sex differences. And he isn't the only one to extend this accusation of politically correct evolution denial to race as well as sex. In 2007, after molecular biologist and Nobel Prize winning plagiarist James Watson's racist views finally caught up to him, William Salatin penned a column for Slate.com in which he described the opposition to the idea of genetically determined race differences in intelligence as liberal creationism. This theme was picked up by Skeptic Magazine editor Michael Shermer, who referred to cognitive creationism as an example in his article on the liberal war on science, and then again by journalist Toby Young in a speech delivered to the International Society of Intelligence Researchers, before finally rebranding the concept as progressive creationism in an article for Quillette. Whatever name is used, the logic behind the charge is pretty consistent. The social sciences have been taken over by the left, who want to believe that everyone is equal in ability, and that all injustice is due to environmental factors. Science, that's science with a capital S, has shown us that people aren't really equal in ability, because evolution. Hence, the leftists in academia deny evolutionary psychology, and everything else that challenges their blank slate thinking. They do this not because they have any legitimate scientific objections, but because of their sacred dogma that we're all the same under the skin. So, is any of this true? Are the critics of evolutionary psychology just a bunch of science deniers, or do they have a point? And does embracing a Darwinian account of human origins force us to accept that some people, some classes, races or genders have innate differences in ability? Let's find out. Attempts to explain human behaviour and culture in terms of evolutionary theory didn't begin with evolutionary psychology. They predate even the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species. By the second half of the 20th century, a small but influential cottage industry had developed churning up books promoting Darwinian, or allegedly Darwinian, explanations of society. The historian Laura Betzig argued that since Darwinian theory, as she understood it, predicts that humans, like all animals, all tend to act so as to maximise their reproductive fitness, that the history of human empires and conflict should be understood in terms of the powerful men competing for access to women, and for resources to support a large number of descendants. Ecologist E.O. Wilson joined Betzig in arguing that human society could be best understood as the result of human behaviours being Darwinian adaptations that serve to maximise reproductive fitness, christening this new genre sociobiology in the process. Sex and violence were the most popular themes, but by the 1980s everything from despotism in the Byzantine Empire to infanticide in India to polyandry in Tibet had been explained in terms of a tendency for humans to seek to maximise their reproductive fitness to increase the chances of passing on their genes. Such adaptation narratives varied from the highly plausible to the outright silly, but two big problems kept reappearing throughout. Even the most die-hard sociobiologist would be forced to admit that no matter how plausible any such narrative may be, there is no shortage of alternative explanations that cannot be ruled out. To which environment precisely are people adapted? Did the adaptation occur in the land where the population now live? If so, were the environmental conditions the same back then? If not, how far back? 
Are you adapted to a distant land in which your ancestors lived previously? How recently are we allowed to conjecture such an adaptation? Could an adaptation be a response to agriculture? To Christianity? To the Industrial Revolution? All three of these have been suggested. The abundance of potential adaptation narratives, the difficulty of choosing between them in a consistent and principled manner, and the difficulty in determining that a cultural trait is an adaptation, led the late evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould to describe the speculative evolutionary histories of sociobiology as just-so stories, a reference to the children's book by Rudyard Kipling. It's always possible to find a story that fits. It's often impossible to check if it's true. The second problem is that human behaviour is highly malleable. Cultures vary across countries and continents, across weeks and millennia. How violent our societies are depends upon how we raise and educate our children, upon the material and cultural opportunities available to its adults, and upon both their physical and economic security. Similar things can be said for social hierarchies, and for the structure of institutions such as marriage. Whether you consider monogamy, polygyny, polyandry or non-monogamy to be the norm, to be exotic or to be abominable will depend upon the culture in which you were raised, and cultures change rapidly. This approach has often been used in studying animals, but many animals live in environments like the ones in which they evolved, modern humans do not. This presents a challenge to those who would offer evolutionary explanations of human behaviour and culture. Which behaviours and which elements of culture are to be explained as adaptations? Same-sex marriage is increasingly normal in the West, but was unthinkable mere decades ago. Having children out of wedlock was taboo not much earlier. Presumably, these changes cannot be adaptations themselves. But if not these behaviours, then which? You'd be hard-pressed to find any behaviours that remain static for very long. Human behaviour is learned. It is constantly changing. It is not an adaptation. These are the problems that the theory of evolutionary psychology was developed to resolve. In order to tame sociobiology, they would utilise the theoretical toolbox developed by a scientific movement that developed parallel to, but separate from it. The id, the ego, the superego, anima, animus, the self, the persona, the shadow, archetypes and the collective unconscious. For early 20th century psychoanalysts like Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, understanding the unconscious mind required the interpretation of dreams and myths, on which basis they drew up maps of the inner workings of the human unconscious that were as elaborate as they were unverifiable. It was this culture of fluffy theorising against which the behaviourists rebelled, Embracing a radically empiricist, even scientistic approach, they rejected theories of the inner mind altogether, and focused their research on that which they could observe directly, behaviour in response to stimulus. There's no way a researcher can know what's going on inside a subject's head. The mind was a black box, the content of which was not a valid scientific question. Instead, they focused on understanding animal behaviour, including that of humans, in terms of responses to physical stimuli, without reference to the inner state of mind. In the behaviourist worldview, parents taught their children language in much the same way that Pavlov conditioned his dogs. The acquisition of language is nothing but a learned response to stimuli. Children learn how to use new words and form sentences correctly by way of imitation, correction and reinforcement. Then, along came a young linguist called Noam Chomsky, and he wasn't having any of it. Drawing on research on the universal structure shared by different languages, and on the learning of languages in young children, Chomsky argued that the linguistic stimuli infants are exposed to is insufficient to explain the relative ease with which they acquired language in all its grammatical complexity. The human brain must possess, Chomsky argued, a language-learning mechanism with built-in knowledge of how language is to be structured. This explained how infants rapidly acquired language, and why all natural languages seem to share a common fundamental structure. Chomsky's theory would revolutionise the field of linguistics, and would have a lasting impact on psychology. The pendulum swung back the other way, empirical behaviourism slipped out of fashion, replaced with cognitive nativism. For this new generation of cognitive psychologists, 
The real question wasn't which stimuli led to which behaviours. The real question was how does the brain process for information and how can we model this process? Theories about the structure and workings of the inner mind were no longer the exclusive domain of psychoanalysts. Chomsky's theory was developed further by cognitive scientist Jerry Fodor in his 1983 book Modularity of Mind, in which he argued that many low-level cognitive processes in the mind are innate, domain-specific, meaning they are specialised to do a single thing, and modular, meaning that they function independently of the brain's more general reasoning capabilities. In addition to Chomsky's language learning function, he identified perception as an example of such a module. We perceive the world in three dimensions, but our brains only receive enough information to construct a 2D image. Our brains, then, Fodor argues, must have innate information when processing these images. This is why our brains can be so easily tricked by optical illusions. They don't just show us raw visual information, they have to interpret it in a hardwired way that can be misled. Because our susceptibility to these illusions is not altered by our knowledge that what we are seeing is an illusion, or our beliefs about what we ought to see, this function must be independent of our higher level conscious minds. And it was this observation which allowed evolutionary psychology to be born. Evolutionary psychology emerged as an attempt to resolve the theoretical difficulties of sociobiology by placing it firmly within the framework of cognitive psychology. While working as graduate students in the 1980s, Leda Cosmides and John Tooby pushed the nativist and modularist approach of Chomsky and Fodor to its logical extreme, arguing that the brain had no general purpose cognitive or learning capability whatsoever, and that instead it was composed of a vast number of highly specialised domain-specific mechanisms. What we perceive as a general problem-solving ability is nothing more than the interaction of multiple such single-purpose mechanisms. It is these cognitive modules, not behaviours themselves, that are adaptations. Taking the view that cognitive evolution is a slow process, they argue that recent complex adaptations are unlikely, and hence these modules are specifically adaptations to the environment of our Pleistocene ancestors. The strength of this approach is that between them, these two theoretical assumptions eliminate many of the more fanciful or contrived sociobiological hypotheses from the get-go. By making cognitive modules rather than behaviours the objects of selection, the theory places no limitations on the potential malleability of behaviour, as the same modules will result in different behaviours when expressed in different environments, while still allowing natural selection to act on these modules based on differential behaviours they give rise to in our shared ancestral environment. Likewise, we would no longer expect human behaviour to be fitness maximising, as our cognitive modules are acting on an environment other than the one for which they are adapted. Attempts to explain the rise and fall of empires, or to better marriage customs in terms of individuals unconsciously seeking to maximise their fitness, are exposed as folly. In tying its own hands by limiting the environment to which we are claimed to be adapted, evolutionary psychology eliminates much of the problem of where a researcher could cherry-pick an environmental problem for which their proposed adaptation was a solution. Adaptations to social dynamics unique to the past few thousand years are out, along with adaptations to agriculture or local climate. We are all adapted to life as Pleistocene African hunter-gatherers. If you remain unconvinced by the potential scientific value of such restrictive theoretical assumptions, it's worth exploring a hypothesis which has been cited even by critics as an excellent example of evolutionary psychology in action. Arguing that the waist-to-hip ratio is the only known feature that has direct bearing on proximate mechanisms regulating health and reproductive ability in humans, and that among the great apes, humans are the only species to possess waist and buttocks, psychologist Devendra Singh argued that men possess a mechanism to detect the health and fertility signalled by the optimal waist-to-hip ratio in women, which he takes to be 0.7, and thus would rank such women higher in sexual attractiveness than others. At first glance, it's tempting to dismiss the hourglass hypothesis, as it's come to be known, as an example of everything that's wrong with evolutionary psychology. To say that it repackages folk wisdom about what men find attractive with a post-hoc evolutionary explanation to pass it off as real science, 
universalizes standards of beauty common to contemporary Western cultures, standards that are known to be culturally variable, and relies on that favorite experimental setup of evolutionary psychologists, ranking pictures of half-naked women by attractiveness. But hold on there. As stereotypically moist as it is, Singh's hypothesis stands out from earlier attempts to explain body type preferences in Darwinian terms by actually making testable predictions. Singh's hypothesis requires that the waist to hip ratio should dominate other factors rather than being one factor among many, and that the preference for his optimal waist to hip ratio should be universal rather than varying with culture like other factors in attractiveness. Now, to be clear, this hypothesis hasn't really stood the test of time. But that's not the point. Most hypotheses are wrong, but that doesn't mean it was bad science to propose them in the first place. The very fact that it can be false means that it is falsifiable, which is a step in the right direction. By requiring proposed hypotheses to be narrowly tailored to fit their strict theoretical framework, Cosmides and Tooby raised the bar for the standard of scientific rigor demanded of sociobiologists. Unfortunately, this very strength of evolutionary psychology as a paradigm would also prove to be its key weakness. By embracing the assumption of massive modularity, Tooby and Cosmides resolved a number of conceptual problems that had been burdening early sociobiology. But in doing so, they made their theory dependent on an assumption that is far from universally accepted within cognitive sciences. Not only is the thesis controversial, it's based not on empirical evidence that a mind actually is so extremely modular, but on an a priori argument that massive modularity should be accepted because it's impossible, in principle, for a mind to have evolved any other way. One of the big dividing lines between the evolutionary psychologists and their critics is whether or not you are prepared to accept this argument with a number of leading cognitive scientists, including the pioneer of the module concept Jerry Fodor, arguing strongly against it. Further trouble comes with the assumption that modules are adaptations. In biology, a great deal of work goes into establishing whether or not any particular trait is an adaptation, and at the end of the process it is common for much disagreement to remain. Not all identifiable traits are adaptations, not all evolution is a result of natural selection. Mutual processes such as genetic drift also play an important role, and traits that are the result of selection may have been selected for a function entirely different to the one that they now serve. These are known as exaptations. Vestiges like the human tailbone or the whale's legs are traits that once served some purpose but no longer serve any function. The belly button serves no practical purpose. It is simply the structural consequence of the umbilical cord, which is itself the adaptation. Traits like this were named spandrels by Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Lewinton in their 1979 critique of adaptationism, in which they warned of the pitfalls of taking adaptation to be the default assumption. While there are still evolutionary biologists, like Richard Dawkins, who defend the idea that adaptation ought to be the default hypothesis, this doesn't change the fact that the adaptationist assumption is highly contentious among evolutionary biologists, and will inevitably produce false positives. But we need not reject a theory just because its underlying assumptions are unrealistic. Radically simplifying assumptions are the basis of many good theories in physics, for example. What matters more, it could be argued, is that these theories produce novel predictions that are precise and accurate. Here too, though, the adaptationist program runs into problems. As Gray, Heaney and Fairhall argue in their Evolutionary Psychology and the Challenge of Adaptive Explanation, adaptation narratives are not hard to come by. Pointing out no fewer than five separate hypotheses for the growth in hominid brain size, for example. The wider the range of hypotheses compatible with the theory, the less helpful the theory for choosing between rival hypotheses. And this leads us back to the problem of just-so stories. Some proponents have argued that a just-so story is just a hypothesis that you don't like. But Gray and his co-authors propose two helpful tests that may help us discriminate between a serious hypothesis and a just-so story. The grandparent test and the lesser spotted brown gerbil test. The grandparent test asks, does this work give us any insight into human behaviour and cognition beyond popular knowledge? While the lesser spotted brown gerbil test asks, 
Would this research be publishable in major international journals if the species was a small, non-charismatic mammal rather than our own? They argue that many evolutionary psychology papers clearly fail both tests. They are just folk wisdom with a post-hoc adaptive story added on. A just-so story. Not only is this bad scientific practice, it exposes as myth the idea that the insights of evolutionary psychology are being suppressed by an academic establishment embarrassed by the politically incorrect truths they contain. On the contrary, the frequency with which EP papers fail the lesser spotted brown gerbil test in particular suggests that it is only the provocative implications of these papers that results in their getting published as often as they are. While the tendency to fail the grandparent test illustrates why EP studies have a tendency to lend unearned scientific respectability to folk wisdom and has a nasty habit of biologizing cultural norms and stereotypes. In light of the fact that there are many reasonable criticisms of evolutionary psychology, both from evolutionary biologists and from the pioneers of the approach to cognitive science on which it is based, the accusation of blank slatism appears to be without merit. But wait, say some evolutionary psychologists. Our critics may not insist that the mind enters the world literally void and without form, but in practice they apply this reasoning selectively, denying its relevance to anything that may impinge upon progressive sensibilities. Why else have the social sciences been so slow to embrace Darwinian insights? Why else do they seem to insist on finding environmental causes for all of society's perceived ills? Why is it insisted that gender differences in education and the workforce are socially constructed? Why do they so often talk about socialization and so rarely talk about adaptation? For one very simple reason. Evolutionary psychology is concerned with the development of the universal human psyche over evolutionary time, whereas the social sciences are usually concerned with variation between individuals and groups separated by culture, space, or historical time. EP tells us nothing about the limitations or causes of variation between individuals and groups, so it rarely gets mentioned in applied social sciences. Social scientists talk about gravity even less when they talk about evolution, but I guarantee you that our society would look very different if it evolved on the moon. There is room for speculative work on how forces of nature like gravity or natural selection shape the human psyche, in ways that are evident in our culture and social organisation. But this doesn't mean that every study in the social sciences needs to pay tribute to the great influence of gravitational psychology upon their work. Anthropologists, who actually do study human origins, never really stop talking about evolution. But most of the objects of inquiry in the social sciences are not themselves adaptations. This doesn't prevent knowledge of cognitive adaptations being of use to the social sciences, but we would expect them to be of use in the same way that knowledge of physiological adaptations are of use, implicitly and with little concern for their specific evolutionary history. Opposable thumbs are pretty crucial to our society, but we don't expect them to get an explicit name check in the theoretical assumptions of your average political science paper. If we have all been endowed by the blind watchmaker with the same set of cognitive adaptations, and these mechanisms place no limit on the malleability of human behaviour, given the right environment, then all variation between people in behaviour, along with the cultural and social structures that result from such behaviours, are the result of differences in environment or physiology. This doesn't mean that innate mechanisms aren't playing a major role in the chain of causation. It just means that differences in innate mechanisms between people are not. When it comes to studying human society, environmental determinism is often a good heuristic. Now, there's a couple of objections that could be raised here. First, it may be objected that our evolved cognitive mechanisms place some strict limit on the malleability of behaviour, that environment offers some small wiggle room, but ultimately we're slaves to our nature. Second, it may be objected that the innate predispositions in our minds may differ greatly from person to person, and between groups of people. Regarding the first of these objections, It's worth referring to what the evolutionary psychologists themselves have to say on the issue. 
In Evolutionary Psychology, A Primer, Leader Cosmides and John Tooby wrote, Innate is not the opposite of learned. For evolutionary psychologists, the issue is never learning versus innateness, or learning versus instinct. More nature allows more nurture. There is not a zero-sum relationship between nature and nurture. Learning is caused by cognitive mechanisms, and to understand how it occurs, one needs to know the computational structure of the mechanisms that cause it. The richer the architecture of these mechanisms, the more an organism will be capable of learning. Most evolutionary psychologists acknowledge the multi-purpose flexibility of human thought and action, but believe this is caused by a cognitive architecture that contains a large number of evolved expert systems. Which is pretty clear. Even evolutionary psychology itself doesn't predict limitations on the flexibility of human behaviour. That doesn't mean that it's right, of course. But if somebody wants to argue for a hard limit on the malleability of human behaviour, the burden of proof is on them. One case where we might expect behaviour to be of limited flexibility is in the very young, those who have not yet been shaped by their environments to a great degree. And surely enough, it is precisely those fields that deal most directly with young minds, which have adopted nativist approaches most enthusiastically, in linguistics, in developmental psychology. Educationalists have spent the last three decades falling over themselves in a rush to embrace the latest neuroscience-inspired teaching fads. Remember when learning types were still a thing? The second objection requires that there be significant genetically determined cognitive differences between people or groups of people. The first thing we should note is that adaptationist approaches can only shed light on mechanisms which are adaptations. They can't tell us what mutations are likely to occur within a population, or how populations will drift apart due to chance. As Cosmides and Tubi argue, Evolutionary psychologists are interested in individual differences only insofar as these are the manifestation of an underlying architecture shared by all human beings. Because their genetic basis is universal and species-typical, the heritability of complex adaptations, of the eye for example, is usually low, not high. Moreover, sexual recombination constraints the design of genetic systems such that the genetic basis of any complex adaptations, such as cognitive mechanisms, must be universal and species-typical. This means the genetic basis for the human cognitive architecture is universal, creating what is sometimes called the psychic unity of humankind. The genetic shuffle of meiosis and sexual recombination can cause individuals to differ slightly in quantitative properties that do not disrupt the functioning of complex adaptations. But two individuals do not differ in personality or morphology because one has the genetic basis for a complex adaptation that the other lacks. The same principle applies to human populations. From this perspective, there is no such thing as race. Sometimes people favour the notion that everything is learned, by which they mean learned via general purpose circuits, because they think it supports democratic and egalitarian ideals. They think it means anyone can be anything. But the notion that anyone can be anything gets equal support whether our circuits are specialised or general. When we are talking about species-evolved architecture, we are talking about something that is universal and species-typical, something that all of us have. This is why the issue of specialisation has nothing to do with democratic egalitarian ideals. We all have the same basic biological endowment, whether it's in the form of general purpose mechanisms or special purpose ones. So there you have it. The leftist ideologues in the sociology departments insist that we're all the same and that race is a social construct, whereas the evolutionary psychologists insist upon the psychic unity of mankind and that there is no such thing as race. Completely different. Evolutionary psychology and adaptationist approaches in general force us to be highly sceptical of racial differences in cognition. If this commitment comes as a surprise to you, it's likely because the name of evolutionary psychology has often been invoked by those seeking scientific justification for an anti-egalitarian agenda. EP is most certainly compatible with innate gender differences, and these claims are among those for which EP is famous, but when done properly, evolutionary psychology doesn't support claims of racial differences. This association came later, and seems to be largely the result of an unprincipled and incoherent attempt to pick and mix controversial theories by anti-egalitarian pundits.
And for those people, I have even more bad news. The few that humans possess a single indivisible general intelligence, which is the single most important factor in performance on all cognitive tasks, is also, somewhat obviously, incompatible with evolutionary psychology's rejection of general purpose cognitive mechanisms in favour of massive modularity. Thus, biologically realist or hereditarian interpretations of IQ test results must also be rejected. Whatever else we might be able to say about the problems of evolutionary psychology, it really ought not be the go-to theory for racist cranks. The fact that evolutionary approaches tend to emphasise the universality of our cognitive traits and do next to nothing to explain or predict differences in them doesn't mean that genetic differences between individuals and groups don't play some role. But even today, genomics is only just starting to make useful polygenic predictions. In principle, these same techniques can be applied to behaviours just like any other trait, but even in medical contexts, where causal pathways are likely much simpler, such statistics must be used with great caution. Some geneticists like David Reich have argued that we should expect to find cognitive differences between groups, but Reich is equally sceptical of a priori narratives about what these differences are likely to be, and there is no credible theory that predicts what differences we would expect to find. Regardless, the idea that such differences follow inevitably from evolution, or that there is a clear scientific consensus that they even exist, is clearly false. At this point, you might be starting to suspect that there's a much deeper problem with the narrative of progressive creationism. We were told that progressives reject evolutionary psychology because it challenges their dogmatic belief that everyone is the same. But not only is there an active scientific controversy surrounding the specific research program of evolutionary psychology, it turns out that evolutionary psychology actually predicts that we are pretty much all the same. Although they fiercely disagreed on the best way to study human evolution, Stephen Jay Gould and Leda Cosmides would probably agree with each other a lot more than they would someone who treats evolution as a magic word that makes injustice disappear. The idea that social hierarchies and inequality result from natural selection isn't new and radical, it's old and discredited. And it's not called evolutionary psychology, it's called social Darwinism. Far from being rejected by social scientists for being too politically incorrect, the name of evolutionary psychology has been appropriated by a clique of hangers-on who use it as a fig leaf for their reactionary political agenda. And when, predictably, those insufficiently in the know hurl back the accusation that evolutionary psychology is a racist pseudoscience, this winds up getting used as yet another example of politically correct science denialism in a talk or a book by Jonathan Haidt or Steven Pinker. Unlike racial differences, innate sex differences are compatible with adaptation-based approaches, and evolutionary psychology predicts that they will likely exist. So this is where our anti-egalitarian's argument is at its strongest. But even here it comes up short. While such differences may be expected to exist, the existence of specific modules, and hence differences in these modules between the sexes, needs to be inferred from differences in behaviour patterns. Differences which, even if culturally universal, are not always genetic in origin. Anti-egalitarians have often sought to blame the lack of women physicists, software engineers and CEOs on innate differences in abilities and preferences. But while some small statistical differences do exist between men and women, in both performance on some cognitive tasks and in neurophysiology, genetic determination has never been convincingly demonstrated. Separating environmental and genetic causes in human development is notoriously difficult. We simply don't have a large control group of people with female typical physiology and male typical socialization to compare against. Frustrated by a lack of empirical evidence, anti egalitarians often appeal to evolutionary psychology's prediction of sex differences to make the a priori case that innate biological causes should be our default assumption. But this too is an error, as the evolutionary psychology FAQ points out. Because social roles are properties of particular groups at particular points in time, evolutionary psychology has little to say about them. Stated another way, evolutionary psychologists can formulate hypotheses about individual preferences, 
but cannot predict much regarding the social arrangements that will result when individuals with different preferences negotiate a social contract. It is also important to remember that most social roles in the modern world draw upon a vast array of physical and cognitive abilities. Though it is conceivable that superior female physical and cognitive abilities in certain domains may, very speculatively, enhance their performance for particular aspects of a given job, whereas superior male physical and cognitive abilities may enhance their performance in other aspects of the same job. In the end, overall performance is likely to be quite similar, with the distribution of female and male abilities broadly overlapping. There may well be innate differences here and there, but the idea that these stack up neatly to give one gender a clear statistical advantage at any particular 21st century job is wildly speculative. Imbalances in gender representation have often been small compared with the imbalances we see in racial representation, which we can be fairly confident isn't due to involved cognitive differences, so the idea that the gap is too large or too persistent to be explained environmentally is clearly false. And women's representation in STEM fields is highly culturally relative, with the gap disappearing or even reversing in some countries. Whether women are recruited into STEM courses at university is a function of environmental variation, not biological variation. And when it comes to explaining such variation, evolutionary psychology is about as useful as gravitational psychology. It took me a lot of time to finish the script for this video. One of the reasons, I think, is because I couldn't quite figure out what purpose the accusation of blank slatism, or progressive creationism, transparent straw man that it is, is supposed to accomplish. Often its use seemed to downplay the possibility or likely significance of change, to make the more tragic aspects of our nature seem fixed and insurmountable. But others who use the term not only accept that we can change for the better, they invoke it while making the argument that our liberal capitalist environment has lifted us out of our archaic savage nature. Perhaps a certain ambiguity is to be expected with what is essentially a term of abuse, but it soon became clear to me that there were two separate debates being had altogether. One debate between evolutionary psychology and its critics, and another debate between those who invoke evolutionary psychology in defence of their anti-egalitarian vision of human nature and those who oppose that ideology. In both cases, the shared effect of the blank slate libel is to invoke a false dichotomy, a false dichotomy between the cartoonish blank slate which no one can take seriously and whatever the speaker is trying to sell. For the doctrinaire evolutionary psychologist, the bridge you're being sold is evolutionary psychology itself. Whereas the scientific debate around EP is over domain-specific versus domain-general cognitive functions and the challenges of adaptive explanation and hypothesis selection, the accusation of blank slatism serves to frame the debate as between those who believe the human brain is shaped by the same evolutionary processes as the rest of the body and the animal kingdom, and those who engage in special pleading to exempt it from such lowly origins. In essence, the accusation serves to create the false impression that evolutionary psychology, and often whatever specific hypothesis is being defended at the time, no matter how dubious, follows inevitably from accepting that evolution doesn't stop at the neck, follows inevitably from Darwinism and its application to psychology, instead of being one possible and highly contentious theoretical approach among many other possible approaches. But for the anti-egalitarian, the sales pitch is that humans are by nature violent and selfish, that gender and racial inequality is natural and the attempts to change this lead to Stalinism. For these types, the charge of blank slatism or progressive creationism is nothing but a slur deployed against those who deny their conservative view of human nature. But the irony behind the attempt to biologize inequality and injustices, to explain away social ills by declaring them to be natural laws, is that one of the most successful results to have come out of evolutionary psychology is the understanding that cognitive adaptations will tend to be universal. Evolutionary theory doesn't force us to accept that inequality is natural. On the contrary, it's one of our best reasons for doubting it. I'd like to thank everyone who signed up to support me on Patreon. I was really taken aback by the success of the launch, and it reassures me that there are people out there who value my content, 
You may have noticed in the clip used at the start of this video that one of the examples of left-wing science denial on Jonathan Haidt's lecture slide is, um, not like the others. There will definitely be a video dedicated to the unquestionable science of stereotype accuracy coming soon, most likely in January. Not only is the claim itself hilarious, it turns out that the history of stereotyping as a concept is quite fascinating. But the next video will be about scientific racism, back when it used to be mainstream science, and how mid-20th century geneticists destroyed it with facts and logic. If either of these videos sound like the kind of content you'd like to support, consider throwing me a buck over on Patreon. Alternatively, leave a comment, like, share and subscribe, that sort of thing. It really helps with YouTube's algorithm. Finally, I'd like to give a special thanks to Hardcore Lime, John Duncan and EvoSight Googling for lending their voices to this video. Be sure to check out their links in the description. See you next time.